The information in this video is provided for informational and educational purposes only. Welcome to Doors of DN, where you'll get a little shot of what my life is like living with SMA. Today I have the opportunity to talk with Andrea Klein from Breathe with MD. She's a wealth of information, so stay tuned after a quick word from our sponsor and we'll talk to her. This vlog was made possible by a sponsorship from Avexis, a company dedicated to developing and commercializing gene therapies for patients and families devastated by rare and life-threatening neurological genetic diseases. To learn more about a treatment for spinal muscular atrophy, visit treatsma.com. That's treatsma.com. It's where you will discover how this treatment works, hear about family stories, and learn about the steps to starting treatment. Visit treatsma.com today. Should we jump right in? Sure. I wanted to talk with you about uh, a little bit about yourself and about Breathe with MD. Okay. So if you wanted to start maybe with telling me a little bit about yourself. Yeah. Um, well, I'm Andrea Klein, and I live with a rare form of congenital muscular dystrophy known as Collagen 6 CMD, and I work full-time outside of the home um, in the healthcare IT field. I'm a business analyst, have been there um, 19 years now, and then kind of in my spare time, so to speak, um, I am the founder and president of my 501c3 named Breathe With MD Inc. And what is Breathe With MD? What What's kind of your focus? Well, um, I was um, basically looking for, initially when I founded this, a way to share my middle sister. Um, she died in 2007, actually on my birthday of all days, um, from respiratory failure. And so after her death was when I learned that things were done so inappropriately in her care, in the emergency room and ICU. And I just wanted to ensure that others um, didn't go through the same thing that our family went through. And so what we do is we educate and spread awareness about breathing muscle weakness or respiratory muscle weakness in neuromuscular disease. And we're trying to just educate the community so that they understand the symptoms, the options for care, and basically equip them so that when they're in a situation, which is so common, when someone in the medical field doesn't understand this issue, that they're knowledgeable enough to speak up and self-advocate for themselves to get the appropriate respiratory care. I agree with that too. Um, I have a brother who passed away when he was about four years old. Um, he, I have spinal muscular atrophy, which is kind of under the MD umbrella. Mm -hmm. And um, he had complications with pneumonia when he was about four years old. And at the time, it was several years ago, and at the time, the knowledge was even less, but I think uh, in the modern times, it's really important that we know what's available and what we can do. Right. So I think what you're doing is important. Yeah, um, I just over the years after her death, I, I actually met other people that had gone through the same thing, but they had survived it. And the majority of them had came out of that experience um, with an unwanted tracheostomy and just a you know huge change in their life from that. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to do is just to get people in the know and really to promote a proactive approach to all of this, because we know that if you're proactive, the outcomes can be so much better versus if you're in a situation like my sister was, where it was really a respiratory crisis and we just reacted. And at that time, we, we really didn't know 
Um, we didn't even know that, that this was possible with our form of muscular dystrophy, that you could have respiratory issues. And unfortunately, I think that, you know, a lot of other adults um, who live with neuromuscular disease are in that same situation until it happens to them. You know, they just really don't know um, how to navigate that situation. And what were some of the missteps in your sister's case? Um, her primary care physician, um, he just, he had never seen symptoms like what she was having. Um, she started developing hand tremors and he knew that she had a neuromuscular disease. So he just assumed that that's what those were associated with. Okay. Um, and she was having little episodes where she would nod off, um, have kind of episodes of micro sleep, sleep for just a few seconds at a time. And you could be in the middle of a discussion with her and she would fall asleep. So, uh, yeah, those, those were symptoms that were definitely missed. And then over time, it reached the point where she was blacking out um, for minutes at a time and um, just extremely fatigued and ended up rolling herself into the emergency room um, for this. And how old was she when she passed away? She was 38. Okay. So entirely too young but um, yeah. she didn't really start developing any symptoms until she was in her 30s oh. um, symptoms that we recognized outward symptoms yeah. but oftentimes the symptoms they kind of get pushed aside and um, thought to be something else okay. um, particularly yeah. fatigue because um, yeah. a lot of us know that you know well we have a neuromuscular disease we're getting older we expect to be tired and fatigued. We don't necessarily recognize that that's a, a primary symptom of not being properly ventilated. Breathe with MD is, are you based on, is it your main Facebook page or how do people hear about you and know about you? We have a pretty big presence on all the common social media platforms. Of course, we have our webpage, which is breathewithin.org. Lots of educational resources there, things that people can print out and share with their physician about this because it's, it's so common for physicians to not understand this or want to treat it like lung disease, um, which it's not. Um, but they can find us on the website. Um, we're also on Facebook as Breathe With MD, Inc. Um, and we have, of course, you know, a presence on Twitter and um, also on Instagram, but we also have our closed privacy uh, support group on Facebook known as Breathe With MD Support Group. And uh, it's a real popular group, have almost 1,200 uh, members of that group now from all over the world. So it's really, really grown a lot bigger um, than I imagined that it ever would. And what are some of the common questions that you get? Well, probably the most common thing is people are trying to understand the difference between CPAP versus BiPAP or BiLevel. That was one of my questions for you. Yes, so, so CPAP stands for Continuous Positive Airway Pressure and it delivers one pressure of air that you're inhaling as well as exhaling against. And the problem for those of us with neuromuscular conditions is that if our breathing muscles are weakened, um, the setting that's needed to fill our lungs is too high to exhale against. And so the whole point of that is to rest your breathing muscles while you're sleeping so that you can be up and aware and you know have energy the things that you need to to do during the day but with CPAP that's kind of counterproductive to that people end up not getting breathing muscle rest um, and they often you know feel that it's just too difficult to wear and use and they don't use it yeah. um, 
But if you contrast that to bi-level ventilation or BiPAP, then it offers two separate pressures of air. A much higher pressure that you inhale, known as IPAP, and then a second, much more reduced pressure, known as EPAP, expiratory positive airway pressure, that can be set low enough you know, for that person to exhale against. And that will provide um, breathing muscle rest during sleep and help balance the two important blood gases, the oxygen level and then CO2 or carbon dioxide, the waste product of that air that we breathe in. And it really just helps with ventilating the lungs, getting air into and out of the lungs, which is our weakened breathing muscles really affects our ability to do. And for doctors unfamiliar that suggest maybe, oh, try CPAP and see how it goes, what do you think about that? Um, some people find a, di- up, find a different doctor. <laughs> yeah, some people end up falling into that trap, so to speak, um, because the doctor will tell them, well, I can't get insurance to approve this until you fail CPAP. Um, and that may be true with your, your insurance, but I always encourage people to seek second opinion referral. Um, I was actually in that same situation. Uh, my physician initially uh, wanted me to tell him what durable medical equipment provider I wanted to use um, to get supplemental oxygen. And he wanted me to use that for a couple of weeks and come back and repeat a sleep study with that on. And I knew after what happened to my sister in the hospital that that was totally wrong. And his compromise to me after discussing all that was, well, we'll just try CPAP for you. You know, no oxygen, we'll just try CPAP. But again, I knew that was wrong. So I sought the opinion of someone that specialized in the breathing issues of those with neuromuscular disease. And right away, she prescribed a BiPAP. So. And another one of my questions you touched on is the supplemental oxygen. Now, yes. I've, I've, I've learned, and I didn't know this uh, in my previous hospital stays, that supplemental oxygen is not a good thing. And Right. Uh, can you kind of touch on that or tell me why that is? Well, with supplemental oxygen, meaning oxygen that we get through like a nasal cannula, um, while we're not using any form of assisted ventilation, it can actually make us worse because it can disturb what's typically already a somewhat delicate balance between the oxygen in our blood and the carbon dioxide, which is the waste product of the air that we breathe in. And it can also, too, affect what's known as the respiratory center in our brain stem. And it's what tells our body to breathe when we stop breathing. And so if you give someone supplemental oxygen and they have weak breathing muscles, then their respiratory center may get the false impression that they're getting enough oxygen to breathe and it may slow down um, their breathing and that will further uh, create a situation where they're not able to exhale enough of the carbon dioxide. So we're loading them up on oxygen and they already are struggling to exhale the waste product of that. So if we give them more, then we're just compounding that carbon dioxide retention issue. but there are safe ways to, to administer supplemental oxygen if it's given with your uh, BiPAP or your non-invasive ventilation or if you're on an um, invasive ventilation. Okay. Um, it, it can be safer. And we have a page on breathewithmd.org that's dedicated to this whole oxygen caution topic. Um, so if you just go there and, and look for oxygen caution, it goes into a lot more detail and shares a lot of medical literature and references to why this is is a problem and things that people can print out and share with their physician on that. Yeah, I think that that was interesting to learn for me as an adult. Um, So 
<laughs> yeah, until my sister's situation, we didn't know either. So another thing I was going to ask you about is going into cold and flu season. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any extra precautions that uh, you think people should be aware of or? Definitely. <laughs> uh, the first one is, is avoidance of other people that are sick. Um, I know sometimes that's impossible to do, um, but even if you can't avoid other people and crowds, just avoiding touching those common surfaces, um, which sometimes um, we have a benefit of being in a wheelchair. We have, you know, push button door openers and we don't have to touch that doorknob. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> probably even more important than that is to get an influenza vaccination. And I know that can be kind of a controversial topic uh, with people because some people don't believe in vaccination, but it's really the best protection that we have um, against flu. Um, it's not a perfect solution, but if you get vaccinated as well as those that live in your home or caregivers that come in your home or those that you work with, that's that kind of provides a, a wedge of protection, so to speak, around you. And if you were to still get flu, um, studies have shown that with the influenza vaccination, uh, the duration of that flu and the severity of that flu is usually reduced. Um, so very, very important to get a flu shot if you have a neuromuscular condition. And are you familiar with like the pneumonia vaccine? Do you recommend that as well for? Yes. Um, and, and there are different schools of thought on that, depending on what physician you talk to. Um, some will actually repeat that vaccination and there's there's different flu vaccines to or pneumonia vaccines rather I should say um, but some will advise that you repeat that every two to three years um, my physician had me get that vaccine I think around age 22 23 and told me that I didn't need it again until I was in my 60s okay. so that's definitely something to talk to your NMD care team about? I know I had gotten one in my later teen years mm -hmm. and then they they said well you'll never need one again and then I started getting pneumonia on a more frequent basis again mm -hmm. so after that I got a booster and then I'm um, getting one every five to ten years. Okay. So, yeah. but yeah, it's something to talk to your physicians about. Yeah, and then the other recommendation that I, I try to give people is to work with your care team and kind of come up with a toolkit of things that you can have on hand proactively so that when you first develop symptoms of a cold or respiratory infection, things that you can, can use or take that might prevent that from becoming a situation where you have to be hospitalized. And, and that toolkit might include an over-the-counter mucus thinner. Um, it could be uh, durable medical equipment like a nebulizer, uh, the Philips Respironics cough assist, those types of things. It may even be uh, keeping prednisone, a corticosteroid on hand or um, antibiotics to prevent maybe a viral infection from developing a secondary bacterial infection or pneumonia. Okay. So very important to, to think in advance of cold and flu season of what you can have on hand and do to, to prevent things, you know, from getting so bad that you, you wind up having no option other than the emergency room. Yeah. Well, I think you've given me a lot of good information. Right. Is there, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about? Yeah, I just want to encourage everyone to um, to follow us on social media, Breathe with MD, uh, particularly on our Facebook page, our public page. We share articles and little infographics and tidbits of information, videos 
things that if you follow that and you watch that on even a weekly basis, within a month or two, you're going to come away a lot more knowledgeable about this topic. And I like to say knowledge is power when it comes to respiratory issues. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you can get in the know about this, you're going to be much more prepared um, to recognize symptoms and to act on those proactively. And of course, if you're not a member of our Breathe With MD support group, go out and uh, join that group because uh, peer support is so important. Um, Even if you have a different disability, you know, um, in all disability groups, peer support is just so important to to being successful um, in living with your condition. Yes. Well, we'll definitely put a link to that on the video here so uh, that everyone can kind of connect and have that information and support so it sounds good so i think we touched on a lot of important things and if anyone wants to learn more they can reach out to you and the breathe with md facebook group and thank you hey okay. bye bye i hope you guys enjoyed the interview i know i learned a lot from talking with andrea We're going to put a link below to Breathe With MD, but that's all I have for you guys today, so we'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.